Welcome to Conversations with Des. I'm your host, Des Blanchfield. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Val Berkovici, founder and CEO of Chainkit, and Dr. Richard White, who is the cybersecurity architect for the Tennessee Department of Transportation. Gents, great to have you. Val, welcome to the show. Great to see you again. Thanks for making time to join us. Pleasure. Thank you for having us. And Richard, we really appreciate you making time to join us. I'm really looking forward to hearing about your, uh, your fun challenge and solution. Uh, today, folks, we're going to have a conversation around uh, Tennessee's Department of Transportation's need to address the challenge of cybersecurity log integrity, and in particular, how Chainkit addressed that need to, uh, as Val uh, paraphrases it, guard the guardians, which I love. That's going to be the title of our video, I'm sure. Uh, Dr. Richard, by the uh, way, those are you know for attribution. Those are Richard's words. That's why I love them. It's you know, <laughs> my customers' <laughs> words are always better than mine. So <laughs> I love it. Fantastic. Well, on that note, uh, Richard, I wonder if you, you could start us off uh, by giving us a brief summary of the challenge you faced uh, to implement uh, this uh, integrity solution, and in particular, how you came to partner with Chainkit to address it. Yes, uh, there was uh, for federal uh, highway agency, uh, FHWA, they had completed an executive uh, summary that they wanted the traffic management centers within the states to have center to center connectivity. Uh, this was to prepare for automobiles or DSRC messages and have a network that was uh, more on the lines of an intelligent transportation system. They refer to it as active ITS. So we have this mandate to upgrade the networks, the camera systems, the RDSs, the RWIS, uh, the HARs, et cetera. And as we work also with universities, we want to collect more data on our highways, uh, collect our roads that feed into the highways, uh, the integrated corridor systems that are coming in the future. And so networks had to be matched or at least increased and, and refreshed to be able to accommodate the new Internet of Things. So we originally started off with doing a vulnerability assessment five years ago and with the old legacy technology, we failed miserably. Another one of the reasons is I was hired to, since I'd come from the Department of Defense and I was an IAM and worked uh, with uh, DAA to accreditate network SIPR and NIPR, uh, they wanted to make sure that this network had become, you know, or get at least a certificate of net worthiness. So we, we implemented FISMA reporting and the NIST Special Publications 800 series and started doing our vulnerability assessments. As a result, failing those vulnerabilities, we were able to purchase brand new equipment and we refreshed the network. And now we have a lot of the latest, greatest uh, technology at the endpoints that we have where we have our cameras and other sensors uh, for our fog zones, uh, for traffic control, digital message boards. And that has to be protected because it's embarrassing once your DMS board pops up something other than something that is related to traffic. So we needed something in that work that uh, had telemetry monitoring, uh, that software defined, that uh, understood context awareness and was growing towards the internet of things. And it needed to be protected and so, of course, like many of the other uh, cybersecurity uh, architects, managers, uh, directors, we center around the CIA triad, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Well, the attack on availability is denial of service, a D word. Same thing with confidentiality, the attack on that is disclosure, another D word. Integrity is dishonesty. Integrity actually is the cross-examination to the other two. You don't know if you have a confidentiality breach. Most of the time availability is obvious because, you know, there's a denial of service. You're not getting serviced. But sometimes that comes from patching and doesn't necessarily have to come from evildoer. And the whole idea of this was to have a network that was uh, effective to be like an anonymous veto type network situation where as the other three and other products that particularly look at one another and devices on the network, that they guard each other. Because if you're only using one 
and not at least three, you won't have that triangulation. One thing Chain Kit did very well was they're excellent with the integrity portions, which are more mathematically intensive than the other two. And we need something that is going to be that, you know, that cross-examination, that interrogator, to be able to look into the other three and make sure that our logs that we're logging, our sys logs, have integrity. We don't want a Stutnex. We don't want somebody telling us our centrifuges are fine, but they're not. So we brought in ChainKit along with several others, Splunk, uh, Forescout, several, because they all interface with each other and they all work in the same triangulation type. We had several security product, products, including Elusive and Darktrace. And we've put these all strategically together so that they're talking to each other. And then as a result, you know, ChainKit can pretty much sit there along with Identity Services Engine Cisco can say, I vote that this person goes into the quarantine VLAN and we're going to monitor them and we're going to do forensics. We're going to do a live investigation, but we're not going to do anything to affect production. So we're using these to guard the guards because a lot of times, yes, the guards guard the king, but then who's guarding the guards to make sure that the guards are guarding the kings? Because we want those prized possessions protected. So we ended up, uh, once we brought Chain Kit in, along with these other products, uh, with Dianetics out of uh, Huntsville, Alabama, we did a adversarial simulation and wanted to see how well all these products work together to detect. And believe you me, even though every one of them are fantastic as standalones, when you put them all together, you're gonna. You know, there's no more zero day. I mean, you you got it. As soon as it as soon as it is on your network, you see it. One of the, one of the adversarial simulations we did was we had made an attachment that someone had opened uh, that was a part of an email attachment that uh, gave them one hundred dollars free Chick Fil A when it was open. Of course, that's where we did all the launch vectors and lateral. I click on that. Yeah, I know. I know. Same here. <laughs> this Chick Fil A, you know, this is important. And uh, so as a result. We did this adversarial simulation because we were not running our own exchange services within our network. They were done by the state. And the state, as a result, we were they were able to jump. They didn't get into the active ITS network because it was protected by these products. But it did was able to move into the South Data Centers in our state where we did have some of the administrative and other TDOT uh, business applications running. So we found out that, yes, this is very important. If you have a critical infrastructure, this is what you want to do. You want guards guarding the guards. That means that you just don't select one product out of three in the bed. You get all three of them. If they can work together, we want all three of them. Hmm, I like it. it. Sounds like a fantastic challenge. It reminds me of the classic Latin challenge uh, phrase that we all would have learned at school. Uh, Qui custodi di ipso custodi, who watches the watches. Val, I believe That's you've right. already implemented a successful proof of concept at this stage uh, for this amazing undertaking. Uh, what was your approach uh, to this challenge in particular and, and, and how did you go about lever leveraging uh, change its key uh, capabilities to address it? Yeah, you know, we're back to what Richard said. It's one thing to think intellectually or academically about this. It's another thing to think and act adversarially. So at ChainKit, we'd always had that adversarial mindset and the technical skills at the lowest levels. You know, with computing can go pretty deep nowadays in terms of the foundation layers we depend on. We always had that skill set of here is a known attack vector. Right. Here are known vulnerabilities in systems. And particularly when exploited, there's no alert, there's no flash, there's no alarm, there's no, no wire to trip. They're very stealthy and visible. Ex, ex, you know, exploitations of these vulnerabilities. Uh, and, and we'd always known these were risks and threats, and they got exposed through the COVID era of 2020 through ransomware. Very much a lot of actors operated with impunity invisibly for months until the extortion demand was very publicly presented to their victims. But we wanted to try and see how we could apply this again outside of just a ransomware theme or scenario. And with these operational networks that were presented to us with the Tennessee Department of Transportation, we call it TDOT for short here, uh, that was an ideal opportunity to just prove the concept that the risk, you know, as Richard articulated so well, 
of these solutions is not mitigated by one or even defense in depth combination of solutions, if you don't have that defense in balance of the CIA triad, if you don't have solutions representing, as Richard said, every one of those three pillars of cybersecurity, you've got partial security, which we all know in the real world means no security. So that was the approach we took. December 13th, of course, changed the world for us in the industry where a lot of these academic concepts and general awareness of the risk of integrity breaches, be it for software supply chains or identity breaches, became very visceral and real. And they've since really been very top of mind discussions where everyone has been reminded of. And, and I think, well, you know, uh, I think the reprioritization has happened where you can no longer ignore one of these pillars of cybersecurity integrity in combination and balance with your other cyber risk mitigations has to be front and center now. Uh, absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Richard, I, I understand that you had a third party undertaker simulation as part of this project to uh, validate uh, the underpinning solution that implemented by ChainKit. What can you tell us about that? Yes, we did a strategic controls assessment again with that same group, Dynetics, out of um, Huntsville, Alabama. And part of that was uh, also adversarial simulations. And once again, and it also happened again, as uh, I think you know, here I'm in Nashville, but we all heard about the Christmas bombing. Indeed. Active ITS services. I'm not saying state services. I'm talking about what's specific to transportation on our highways and roadways. Right. Never lost services. And we use AT&T, TenNet, as a separate service for us, dedicated towards us on MPLS. Okay. So as a result, you see what I'm saying? You know, we, as an active ITS network, didn't lose any services. Sure, they lost email to the state, and they lost some other, you know, uh, they lost some other services. But the basic services that saved lives were up and running. Yeah, I guess no one minds not getting an email about their uh, lunch meeting, but uh, the likes of AT&T's first net and other critical infrastructure uh, remain in place. and. This is where you yes, still have to make sure that your data is okay and that you're not uh, impacted as a part of the flow on. Exactly. And then shortly after that, I mean, I think we're all aware of solar winds. We use solar winds, but something that in security you're not supposed to do, we didn't upgrade. Right. So, as a result, you know, I mean, that was a blessing. <laughs> uh, uh, and I thought it was interesting, and sometimes a lot of people patch, 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 and one thing we did in the Department of Defense and the CIPRANET side is there was product out there that had never been upgraded. Right. So we knew it was working and we knew what normal was. You know, I mean, you and you challenge and you use totally quality management to find out what is your common causes and your special cause variations. Once you get a good telemetry of your network, why do you want to change it? Yeah. How do you the patch wasn't, you know, I mean, full of some type of integrity attack? So a lot of times uh, the military handled that by, of course, taking uh, those common vulnerabilities and exposure CBEs and making what was known as IAVAs. Yep. And there was a lot of product that was commercial off the shelf that we didn't use. And so we're trying to treat a lot of TDOT systems that way, more as these are tactical computers and not something that's not a toy. We're going to treat it as a weapon because if we don't clean it and look at it and handle it correctly, you see what I mean, and then point it at evildoer, uh, we do nobody any justice to let them use our computer that we think is a play toy as a weapon against us. So we also adopt that and chain kit and a lot of the other product out there is helping us achieve that. Yeah, allow me, if you will, I think this is a good opportunity for a mini rant on zero trust. Very much in favor of it, but the fact that people are very, I think, myopic in terms of how they implement it. So the core concept we all know very well explicitly verify before trusting something. And it's being applied from a vendor perspective very, very liberally now by customers for access, the outside and approach to zero trust. Make sure that anyone from any device, we're always having the identities, the devices, the custom network segments we create and the resource being requested. Very much zero trust access is, is doing well in the marketplace right now. But what Richard just described and what SolarWinds exemplifies is the uh, other end of the coin, the other side of the coin, which is the inside out versus outside in zero trust model where all these core services, third party vendors and others that we're 
blindly trusting and depending on today shouldn't be that way. We should be explicitly verifying these core services we depend on just as much as we verify what's being, you know, what's accessing those core services. Right. And the, the, the inventors of zero trust, John Kendervag and Dr. Chase Cunningham, have this definition called zero trust extended, ZTX, which covers it. And my personal rant is let's see more ZTX used in the marketplace to complement the success of ZTA today. No, absolutely. Well, I, I really appreciate you both making time to, to, to share this. Uh, uh, journey so far uh, in that I think it you know there's so many commonalities uh, across every key industry sector and every uh, business group and particularly in state and federal government uh, uh, in the context of all the things you've outlined and we could potentially uh, discuss it all day but I was very very keen just to understand the, the background of this whole challenge of you know guarding the guards or guardians as it were and, and particularly the uh, integrity of your cybersecurity logs and, and, and the data and pinning that. Uh, I, Gentlemen, uh, congratulations to both of you. Uh, Dr. Richard White, congratulations on getting this proof of, uh, of concept up and running. And, and I'm sure we'll uh, talk again soon about uh, the next phase of this project. And Val, uh, congratulations to you and your team at ChainKit on, on, on implementing this great solution, having it uh, challenged by a third party and by the sounds of things proven to be successful. Uh, just a quick uh, wrap up, Val, uh, for folk who are likely to have exactly these sorts of pain points and are looking at a buying decision to, uh, to find a partner preference to help them with exactly these challenges, uh, how should people reach out to yourself and the team at ChainKit to start that sort of conversation? Well, since nobody uses a phone anymore, you know, hit up our website. You can certainly email me at valb at chainkit.com, the website. I'm pretty prolific on social media, you know, on Twitter, if you don't mind a lot of Twitter rants or LinkedIn, where we keep it professional, very easy to reach and uh, looking forward to engaging in the conversation. Fantastic. Well, uh, Richard, thank you very much for your time. It's been great to uh, see you and I'll look forward to having you back on the show again soon. Yes, thank you, Des. Appreciate it. And Val, as always, it's an absolute pleasure seeing you and hearing the amazing wisdom that comes from you on every one of these key challenges. And uh, we'll look forward to having you back again soon as well. Can't wait. And folks, we'll have more information in the show description below. We'll have links to the relevant resources and all the relevant information that uh, Val just outlined with regard to how to get in touch. Uh, I think that the key thing I will summarize here is that uh, this conversation is happening whether you join it or not in your organization. More often than not, the conversation is being held by the bad guys who are looking for vectors to get into your organization. So there is no time like the present to reach out to Val and his team at ChainKit to have a discussion around what are the issues, what are the risks, and what can they do to help you mitigate that on an ongoing basis. And in, in the example of uh, the Tennessee uh, Department of Transportation, go through, I guess, a design, trial, implementation, proof of concept, challenge that, and then, and then put it into production. Uh, make sure you do reach out sooner than later to have that conversation because nobody wants to be on the front page of any uh, media for these very reasons. But more importantly, we just want to keep our world around us safe. Uh, thanks for tuning in, folks. Uh, please do reach out to uh, Val and his team at Chain. can have the conversation sooner or later, and we will look forward to you placing any questions you have in the comments as well. Join that conversation on social media and follow uh, both gentlemen. We'll have those links as well, and we'll see you in the next video. I'm Des Blanchfield. Thanks for tuning in to Conversations with Des.